He's a voice from the indefinable all that is for all who are attempting to override the program called the Matrix that controls humanity, a race lost in a cosmic game, drowning in the rules of what he terms the God program. We know this voice as David Icke. In his new book, Infinite Love is the Only Truth, Everything Else is Illusion, he beckons us to a place beyond the Matrix, a still point where nothing vibrates and everything just is. Infinite oneness and all possibility are its names. This is the unknown country. This is Dreamland, and we welcome David Icke. Hello, David. How are you? I'm good, William. You? Oh, it's fantastic. Thanks so much uh, for joining us today. I understand that uh, you've just returned from South Africa. Yeah, I just had an amazing uh, 10 days with uh, someone who's become uh, one of my uh, closest friends called Kreda Mutwa, who's... Uh, uh, a Zulu shaman, but he's, he's known as a Sanusi. It's the the highest level of their shamanistic stream. He's 83 now. He's wow. been initiated into the ancient African knowledge now for 50 years or more. And um, we we just hit it off the first time we met some years ago, and we've become really really close friends. And what's fantastic, William, when you meet people like Cradell, is that you realise that. Although we may use different names, we're all actually talking about the same basic knowledge. Um, and what uh, confuses us and gives us the the feeling of division and difference is is just the language we use. Uh, for instance, well, one of the things he did for me was uh, throw the bones, throw the animal bones. Now, to people in the West, they'd go, throw the animal bones, it's a witch doctor. Oh. And all these bones were, were um, animal bones that actually go back a long time and they're carved uh, into shapes and symbols and they just read the energy field in exactly the way that um, things like tarot cards and rune stones and stuff like that do in fact Kredo's wife not only is a, a bone thrower and uh, amazingly accurate like he is uh, she's also a, a tarot card reader so it's kind of the interesting to, to see that we're all sp- talking about the same basic uh, themes, but we just use different language, and that confuses us. And Kratos is fantastic because he sits at that uh, that cusp point between the ancient African knowledge and what we call the, the the modern or Western world. And he can talk both languages, which is why it's uh, uh, very easy to um, spend time with him and see that indeed we are all um, talking about the same uh, one knowledge uh, in uh, only uh, language forms uh, that are different. Mm-hmm. You know, when uh, Whitley interviewed me recently, he asked why I wanted to talk with you. We had, had announced this interview, and I told him that uh, our mutual buddy, Tr- Tim Crawford at UFO TV, had... Oh, Tim, yeah. Uh, yeah, at uh, UFO TV had sent me a copy of your Matrix DVD, which I thought was phenomenal. And what I had told Whitley is I said, look, here's a guy, David Icke, he's been on this path a long time. He's on an amazing path of discovery. And I just sense that he's about to go through the Stargate to the next level of understanding. And I knew that you had a new book coming up out about this transformation. And I was really excited to talk with you about it. And so now that I've had a chance to read Infinite Love is the Only Truth and Everything Else is Illusion, I first want to congratulate you on your 15th book. I mean, that's astonishing. Is that how many is now? Yeah. I mean, that's... Okay, I don't count him. You know, I, I keep... I'm going to one. I start, I, I start look, look, looking, uh, you know, going on the path to... For, for the next the next stage, because what you say, William, is absolutely right. Um, it's funny enough when when I wrote my first uh, book on um, these kind of subjects, going back to ninety one now, uh, called Truth Vibrations. The opening line is um, something like, I'm, "I'm just starting a journey, and maybe you'll come with me." Because it it was um, it was clear to me then that um, this was going to be a journey. Uh, and the thing is that that I find it, 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 there's a a great quote that's attributed to uh, the uh, Greek uh, philosopher Socrates, which is, wisdom is knowing how little we know. Mm-hmm. And what tends to happen uh, too often, I think, um, is that people do really great work at one level of understanding, whether it's the five sense conspiracy and the banking conspiracy and all that stuff. And that's great. They do fantastic work on my hand up to them. But if you stop there, you're only going to get part of the picture. And unfortunately, one of the great things that edits people off the path of continuing to walk is belief, belief systems, whether it's religious belief system or whatever. They start to um, come across 
information, understandings that are completely at odds with their belief system, and they tend to either dismiss them or, or simply won't go there because they, they, they know their belief system will be under pressure. What I've done, because I just want to know what, what, what the truth is uh, within me, I, you know, I, uh, that's, that's my um, prime motivation. I, I really want to know uh, the, the nature of what we're um, involved in here, the nature of reality, life, everything. And uh, so I just keep walking, and it's taken me from five cents investigation of, uh, you know, like I say, banking scams and 9-11 scams and all that stuff into the interdimensional um, level of it. And now with with this book, it's... Um, it's a leap into the into the, the the structure of the illusory reality within which all the other stuff actually unfolds. Yeah, I think, uh, and that's a great place to start. In fact, let's uh, begin sort of with the root chakra of your work and wind our way through your path of transformation. The, the world you've said is controlled by a network of secret societies manipulated by the Illuminati, who have structured our world to create maximum fear and stress. And this is because, I believe you say, that in the interspaces of the matrix is a lost reptilian race that feeds on human fear, which means that Earth, in a sense, is a fear farm, and then DNA, DNA then becomes the fear antenna or transmitter that connects us to that matrix. Talk about how you came to this conclusion. Well, um, uh, let's um, maybe make the point straight away. I didn't go looking for it. I mean, you don't sit in a darkened room um, and think... I just concluded this is what's going on, uh, because from 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 our uh, conditioned reality, I mean, it's like, what did he say? Um, what happened was, and, and my life's been like this. Um, it would take too long to talk about it now, but I had an amazing series of experiences when I was uh, still a television presenter with the BBC, and just afterwards, um, that just blew blew my head off, and. For about three months, I didn't know what planet I was on. This is back in 1990, uh, and um, where, or 1991. And uh, when everything settled down, um, I uh, looked at the world in a completely different way, and it was like a veil had lifted. Um, instead of hearing the words of politicians and people like that, I was seeing the, I was reading the silences and the white bits between them, and. Uh, I started to hit this amazing synchronistic uh, path from the early 1990s, which was leading me to uh, knowledge and information and people and people uh, who uh, were researchers, yes, but also people who were on the inside of this, people who had been victims of it. And very clearly, uh, a, a structure emerged of a few interbreeding families who were sitting at the top of a a compartmentalized multi-level pyramid of control um, in which they controlled the banking cartel, the political system, the education system, the uh, the uh, pharmaceutical um, cartel, the oil cartel, the transnational corporations, the media at ownership level. And um, when you, when I realized how the structure worked, it was a bit like um, putting the, the straight bits together in a jigsaw. Once you've got that frame within which it works, you can put the pieces in the middle together quicker. And so it's got faster and faster as the 90s unfolded and became the uh, 21st uh, century, uh, that these puzzle pieces have gone together. And it's, it's um, no longer a theory in the sense that things I was writing about, not just me, there's loads of people out there. If it was just me, I'd think, why is it just you? No, this is this is this unbelievable numbers of people out there now who are researching this from their different levels, their different points of input and different perspectives, and coming to the same basic conclusions. Um, and we're now seeing this centralized Orwellian state, that this centralized fascist Orwellian state that we've been talking about all this time now unfolding before our eyes, and it's happening for a simple reason, a simple equation: if you are the few and you wish to control the many, you have to centralize decision-making. The more points of decision-making there are, the more diversity of decision-making, the less control you're going to have over those decisions. So if you look at um, the way society has moved, and it's moving so rapidly now, it's moving more and more to fewer and fewer, making more and more decisions, affecting more and more people. This is what we have with the European Union, and as I've pointed out in my books for years, what, where this is leading 
is a centralized global state with a world government, world central bank, world army imposing the will of the world government, um, a world currency, and a microchip population. Now, it, it, when I talk about this now, people go, well, I can see it, mate. It's happening. It's happening. They're talking about microchipping, and they look. Um, but when I started out, they were going, you're mad. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so there is a seed change, and particularly since 9-11, William, really, mm-hmm. where a lot of people have opened their minds and thought, and not only just opened their minds, but intuitively started feeling, hey, there's something not right here. What's going on? Um, and and um, uh, But by the time that had started to happen, I was already um, moving on into the interdimensional level, and um, and uh, stretching people's uh, um, incredulity even further because I started um, from about the mid 1990s, maybe about 97. I started to meet people again. My life's been like this since 1990 uh, and 19, uh, 90, 1989, something like that. It's, it's very synchronistic. What happens is, um, and it still goes on today, a subject or a theme will come into my life for the first time. And then suddenly, wherever I go, I'm meeting people, seeing things, experiencing things, reading things that relate to that subject or that theme. And the reptilian thing came in from about, like I say, 97, 98, and really um, uh, started to build in terms of the number of people who were telling me of their same basic experience, which was of seeing an apparently human uh, form a human being transform into a reptilian type entity and then back again sometimes it was quick sometimes it stayed in a reptilian form for longer and I was meeting people all over the world um, uh, that were telling me this story and I wasn't going looking for them I was just walking into them mm-hmm. and one of the one of the big things again uh, in relation to this uh, William comes down to Credo Mutwa because the reason we got together was I was on a speaking uh, tour of South Africa and I got this call from Credo and he said we must meet he said I've just read your book The Biggest Secret he said how do you know this um, about the Chittahuri and uh, the Chittahuri um, uh, translates as the children of the serpent or the children of the python mm-hmm. and of course my uh, my ears pricked up immediately and over I was uh, meeting him and we talked for hours for days and he told me how the uh, theme of shape-shifting reptilian, quote, gods, um, who interbred with humans, creating a hybrid race that became the, the royal um, uh, demigods of ancient society, was fundamentally part of his black African culture. And, that, and, and when I was talking to him only um, last week, uh, he was telling me of the number of uh, women who, who are in Africa, out in the bush, um, who are coming to him pregnant, having not had sex, um, and, and, and telling him that it's a, a reptilian entity that appeared and, 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 and been involved in this. And then within about three months or so, um, the, the baby's gone. They wake up and the baby's not there anymore. And, and he's, you know, he, he's a real feet on the ground guy, Credo. He's got one foot in this Western, uh, view of the world and one foot in, Black African and knowledge and culture, and um, he's, he has had so many people like this tell him this recurring story. Um, that, and of course, he's experienced it himself. He's seen shape shifting uh, on many occasions in um, in, um, in his life over the last eighty-three years. And so, um, when people in uh, the Black African uh, bush are telling you the same story as someone who's experienced something in Los Angeles or Sydney, Australia, or London, England. Um, then you start to see a common theme. Now, what you can do at this point is say, hey, not going there, I can see what people are going to think of me, um, and you walk away and you stay safe. Um, I'm not interested in staying safe, I'm interested in what's going on. So um, I, I put that information out, and what's interesting is you then become a, uh, a magnet for people who um, uh, want to tell you about their experiences. So it's, it's far more, it's not a common thing, uh, this uh, experiencing of shape shifting, but it's far uh, less um, uncommon than people would uh, would believe, given the fact they never hear about it. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're talking today with David Ike. 
David, in the book, you asked what I consider to be the magic question. What is the human body? And how does it relate to the scenario you're describing with the, the shape-shifting reptilian? Well, it, what, what's interesting, uh, William, is when you um, look at what um, science has already established in its various disciplines, it's actually sussed a great deal of the nature of reality already, and it's illusory nature. Um, but the disciplines of science don't tend to talk to each other, and uh, there, there is a, um, a um, party line often, um, which um, a lot of scientists will stick to um, and, and not go beyond because it's safer that way, not least in securing funding and uh, prestige, not to go um, beyond, uh, quote, the norm. But when you look into the fact that atoms that make up our so-called solid world are not solid at all. Um, when you think that um, what we call the five senses are electrical signals interpreted by the brain, um, when you think that um, the, the brain is decoding uh, these signals into an apparent 3D holographic reality, um, just like um, a television uh, decodes waveforms into uh, flat pictures, so our brain is um, decoding um, waveforms into holographic, apparently three-dimensional forms, which we think is the world around us, but actually only exists in our head. So when you you start to put these, these basic things together that have been established, well, it's clear that our, our um, reality is an illusion. And we get this recurring theme where people in you know, various um, uh, New Age and other um, areas of thought say, you create your own reality, we create our own reality. And, and, and clearly that's the case, because um, there's, there's a number of stories that I tell in this book and the previous one, uh, Tales from the Time Loop, of, of how um, stage uh, hypnotists hypnotized people to believe certain things and that is what these people um, actually experienced and what is happening here the hypnotist is implanting a belief into the person's mind uh, stroke brain uh, into his computer and what happens then is as the brain decodes reality it decodes it on the basis of the person's belief in what is real. Um, uh, um, psychological and scientific experiments have revealed that um, we um, change 50% um, and more of the detail of information that enters the brain before it hits the visual cortex and becomes what we think is the world around us. And we do this, this, this uh, work has shown, on the basis of our belief. And I told them, I tell a story in the in the book um, of a guy called Tom who was at a party uh, which was experienced by a man called Michael Tol Tolbert who wrote a brilliant book The Holographic Universe it's amazing um, book absolutely yeah brilliant book and um, his father hosted the party and he got a stage hypnotist along and he did his various party tricks and he sat this guy Tom down and he got him to eat a potato thinking it was an apple now this how, how does that happen it's real simple you, you implant the belief in the brain that it is um, experiencing an apple, um, and therefore, as the uh, electrical signals from the potato come into the brain, they are decoded into the taste of an apple. And it's what you believe is what... And, and, and if you take that phenomenon across the whole of life experience every day. We are editing reality all the time based on our beliefs. But anyway, what happened is this guy, Tom, was sat down and the hypnotist said to him when I bring you back from a waking state you're not going to be able to see your daughter and what he did then was led the daughter to stand right in front of her father so he's looking into a midriff mm -hmm. he then brings him out of the trance state apparently so and says to him Tom can you see your daughter and he looks around the room and he says no I can't see her she's not here um, she starts giggling uh, but he can't hear her the hypnotist then goes behind the daughter and puts her, um, his hand in the small of her back and said, I'm holding something, Tom, what is it? And Tom looked bemused because it looked obvious to him. He said, you're holding a watch. He said, I'm, um, there's an inscription on the watch. Can you read it? He peered forward and read it. Everything is going on behind the daughter's back between him uh, and uh, the, the watch and Tom. 
Now, this would seem to be, on the, and, and would be, on the basis of, yes, this world is solid and this is all kind of real and it's, you know, it's not an illusion, it would be impossible. But when you realize that we are constructing reality in our own minds, um, it makes total sense because we are, we talk about living in the universe, but actually, if there's six billion people on this planet, we're living in six, they're living in six billion universes. Mm -hmm. The question was though, William, and this is really the, the, the crux of this, this book, that, that it was a very good question that needed to be asked. Okay, we are creating our own reality by our belief and our sense of perception and, and our point of observation. Okay, but how come we all see the same car going past the window, how come we all see the same forest and the same two people crossing the road? That was the question, and, and I was looking um, for what is it that plugs us into this collective reality? And then a friend of mine um, came around. He's, um, he used to be a, a health investigator for the, uh, the government in Britain. He used to investigate um, health things, that uh, health issues and health situations that... Um, were were either strange or or, or perhaps um, needed um, you know criminal investigation. Uh, one of the things he did, just as a quick aside, he was telling me the other night. This has been an interesting uh, point to, to follow up for someone. He, um, I was telling him the story uh, very quickly of how Greta Mutwa's wife Virginia um, was pronounced dead at um, uh, three o'clock and uh, woke up absolutely alive six hours later in the mortuary. And he said, well, when I was an investigator, he said, um, health investigator, he said, I investigated a number of cases of people who were pronounced dead and woke up in mortuaries perfectly alive. And he said, you know what, what won the common theme when they woke up in the morgue? But he wanted to put that in his reports, and they wouldn't let him. Um, anyway, um, so this guy, is, he, he's, he's an alternative healer and a, a brilliant one. He's worked on me and my family and um, had terrific results. Anyway, he comes round to, to see me. I haven't seen him for a while. And we started talking, and he said something about DNA. He said, oh, years ago, he said, I wrote a, I wrote a report about DNA. Mm -hmm. He said, and uh, that they're only now starting to find out um, some of the things that I, I wrote um, that DNA was about. And he said to me, he said, um, DNA is a crystalline um, substance, which is um, a... Uh, receptor transmitter, a receiver transmitter of light, of information. And when he said it, it was like someone had just come up and smacked me on the head. Lights went on all over the place. And I started um, going down this road of looking at what is DNA. And what I've uh, I talk about in the book is it's DNA that connects us into the matrix that connects us into this collective reality because people don't realize you know we talk about DNA and you hear people talk about DNA and scientists they do it when, in a way that gives you the image that they suss DNA oh yes DNA we know about DNA they don't know nothing about DNA virtually depending on the, the scientists that you talk to anything between 90 and 97% of DNA, conventional science calls junk DNA because they don't know what it does. Um, and it's this that is connecting us into the matrix. And it's this that is tuning us in to the collective reality. And what I describe it like in the book is like we live, this matrix is like a holographic internet. And we, through the body brain, um, connect into it through the DNA really connect into it um, in the same way that if you log on to the internet in China or the United States or, or Britain or Germany you are logging in to the same collective reality now when you do that you can make um, different choices and decisions and opinions on what you think of it that's how we put our unique little spin on, on this collective reality we see the same car but you might like it I might not but we're sharing the same real collective reality now this, what's happening um, in terms of the DNA uh, and uh, what I call the biological computer, the body, um, is that it is connecting us in to this uh, waveform um, network, the matrix, and we are um, decoding the signals 
like a computer into, instead of a flat picture internet, a holographic, apparently three-dimensional internet. And what kind of it took me aback is when I'd finished the book and it was going off to um, the design that we put together as a book, I came across this article about geneticists and linguists and various other people to try to find out what this um, uh, junk DNA actually was and what it did. And they concluded that the body is a biological computer, which is exactly where I'd come from, from a completely different uh, uh, point of view, a starting point. And that knowledge is the knowledge that can set us free. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. Okay. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. My guest today is David Icke. His new book, Infinite Love is All There Is, Everything Else is Just an Illusion, is available at bridgeoflove.com. His narrative, supported by Neil Haig's superb color illustrations, will change the reality, the life of everyone who has the courage to read it. I found myself appreciating all that I encounter in a more loving way while reading the book, and I know it's need-to-know information for everybody in the Dreamland audience. David, you, you are making the point that the human body is a biological computer. The DNA that makes up our body are tuners or receivers that is captured within this massive net called the matrix. As you're speaking, I'm recalling uh, some of the Sumerian myth that Zacharias Sitchin had reinterpreted in which the Anunnaki used a weapon system called a net where they virtually trapped an entire sector of space within this net. And I wonder if you could comment on perhaps the, the correspondence between this ancient image of this of the net of the Anunnaki with this concept of the matrix and the way we're enfolded or entrapped within it. Well, they could well be connected um, because uh, when you start looking at this uh, this whole uh, network, uh, I'm talking about this DNA network, this matrix network, it's not just that we are receiving information, we're also transmitting it. And what's kind of interesting is that the nature of um, a hologram is that every single part of a hologram contains a smaller version of the whole. Um, if you um, take a holographic print and you cut it into four and you fire the laser at it, you do not get a, a quarter version of the size of the picture. You get four smaller versions of the whole picture. Right. The fact that the body is a hologram explains why every single cell in the body contains all the no- information necessary to grow a whole body because it's a hologram and must be like that. This is why reflexology and acupuncture and all these other alternative um, healing uh, disciplines can find um, all areas of the body in the foot, in the ear, in the hand, wherever. Right. Um, and this takes us on to this, the, the next level of that, which is what I'm suggesting is that we are not only um, holographic in terms of our body, but we are um, experiencing a what I call a super hologram, which is the matrix. And uh, which has all the smaller levels of that hologram within it in various forms. So if you take that and project it to the bigger picture, the basic structure of the body hologram um, must be reflected in the super hologram. And what we have um, in the body is the DNA that is receiving and transmitting information. We have the brain, which I call um, the central processing unit of the body, the central processing unit of the biological computer where all the um, the traffic goes through and is interpreted. Um, so the, if we are a hologram within the super hologram, the super hologram must also have its version of the brain, its version of DNA receiving and transmitting. And uh, for me, it's a two-way thing. We are receiving information, but at the same time, we are transmitting information, not just um, uh, between each other, but back to the matrix. And, and for me, this is what evolution is. When, what we call evolution, when, when, when for instance, uh, an, 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 an animal will uh, change its environment, and, and over a period, that animal's um, look and everything will change um, to fit in with the environment. And for me, this two-way process of communication is what 
we call um, evolution. But the point that I make in the book, and this is the crucial one, I think, is that the reason we're caught in it is because we identify the biological computer, the body, with who we are. And if you, if you do that, then the computer runs the show, not consciousness, which I define in the book because everything's conscious, everything within the matrix is conscious. I define consciousness for the purposes of the book as that which is beyond the matrix, that is, which, which is um, not caught in the illusion. And so um, to connect with that consciousness um, is not very easy when you're identifying who you are with the computer, i.e., I'm David Icke, I was born in Leicester, and, and this, this is who I am. Because it's clear to me uh, that what we call mind, thought, what, when we think, and emotion are actually part of the program. And someone once said something brilliant. They said, we are not our thoughts. We are the silence between them. And for me, that silence between the thoughts is who we are in terms of infinite consciousness. And infinite consciousness is all-knowing. It doesn't have to think and work it out and go through all the chatter that we go through all the time um, through thought. It knows it's all-knowing. That's why it's silent. It doesn't need to think. It just knows. And we have got caught in identifying our thoughts and our emotions with who we are, and we've lost sight of the fact that we are actually that all-knowing silence between them. This is why when people go into a meditative state, um, they can o- often get great insight into things, which they can't when the chatter's going, all oh, the noise and pollution, the noise pollution that's going on all the time in this uh, five-sense uh, world is because they're accessing all-knowingness, which is what they really are. And I find it interesting that psychologists um, say that they can break human personalities down into like 12 archetypes and combinations of those archetypes. Mm-hmm. My question is, well, hold on a minute. If we are talking here about all possibility, how come you can break down human personalities into about 12 archetypes and, 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 and combinations of, of, of them? Because they are not talking in terms of those archetypes, I would suggest, about um, all-knowing infinite consciousness, all possibility. They are identifying the traits of the program the body programs, the personality programs, because we react um, to um, so predictably because we're caught in following the program and not following infinite consciousness. When you access that, that's when you become a maverick. That's when you're doing things against the tide. And people say, what's he doing? He's strange. No, he's connected. Not strange. Strange to you because you're following the program. And it's like, um, it's like riding a horse, the body, when the body is actually deciding where you go, not the rider, consciousness. And that's where we've got caught. And if we can get that connection back to knowing who we are, which is not David Icke from Leicester or William Henry. These are just names for um, experiences. They, uh, we are infinite consciousness. When we get to that level, then we can start taking control back from the program from the matrix because compared with the the, the, the matrix um, infinite consciousness uh, is uh, uh, just indescribable in terms of its uh, greater power understanding in everything I mean you know the, the matrix is a two stone weakling faced with infinite consciousness but not if we uh, don't access it and follow the program because then the matrix controls us yeah, in, in the book you say or note that unless we operate from that higher level of awareness beyond emotional reaction, the matrix is going to continue to construct our reality. And as you know, it's the limbic system of the brain. And I thought you did some fantastic research on the brain, by the way. You, you note that it's the limbic system, the amygdala, hypothalamus region of the brain that's responsible for regulating our emotional state. And this is precisely the region of the brain that's targeted by the chemicals used in mass marketing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's it's clear when you, the more that I understand the bigger picture, the more um, clear it is why the five sense level of this, a daily society, is structured as it is. Whether it's um, monosodium glutamate, 
which is what? Tricking the brain to decode more taste than is there. Um, whether it's aspartame, whether it's fluoride in the water, whether it's mobile phones or mobile phone masts, they are all um, throwing out the balance of the brain and the way it reads reality. Um, and uh, once you do that, it's more and more difficult for consciousness to express itself. It's like uh, me sitting here uh, trying to work a computer that's got a virus. It's very difficult um, to, to make it do what you want to do because it's not working properly. And there is this assault on, 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 on the body. And, and what, what's interesting uh, to me is that not only do our emotions react to chemicals that are introduced to the body, um, we produce chemical reactions in the body, in the computer, when we feel emotions. And the receptors on the cells that receive these chemicals are exactly the same receptors that receive drugs like heroin and pharmaceutical drugs and all the rest of it. And it, it, I've been saying for years, just by uh, observing, and uh, not only observing other people, but observing myself. I mean, I'm not sitting cross-legged on a mountain here saying, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll enlighten you all. I mean, I'm going through this and all learning from experiencing this computer too. And it was clear that people... Um, in large numbers are addicted to certain emotions. I, I've called it in previous books emotional addiction. Now I understand why they're addicted. They're addicted because they are addicted to the fix of the chemical that is released by that emotion. This is um, William and, Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're talking with David Icke. By the way, the entire catalog of David Icke's books and video presentations are available at bridgeoflove.com. In addition, visit davidicke.com, one of the web's most visited websites on conspiracy material, and I'm sure by listening to David today you can tell why. David, uh, when we had to cut the way to that break, you were talking about how people are addicted to emotions and the chemicals of these emotions. Could you continue along with that, please? Yeah, this is why people get addicted to being depressed. And it was interesting. I, I watched a, um, a, a, a film um, which showed how the brain, when you get into a certain emotional state, the brain creates like a, uh, a net, a network of connections that relate to that emotional state, like depression. And what happens is that unless that emotional state is changed, the reality of that person is then um, decoded through this network of brain connections. In other words, it's decoding the uh, reality the person experiences um, to fit in with the belief in what the world is like for them, i.e., it's depressing, the, 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 the glass is never full or it's never half full it's always half empty or empty completely and you know m my mother has this uh, phrase about some people she says you know it's being so miserable it keeps them going and, and, and often you can see that in people and it's also you know people say I'm addicted to love they'll jump from one partner to another partner to another partner because they're addicted to that chemical that comes with, 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 with the, the, the first um, you know connection of love and attraction so um, all the time we are um, being subject to these various chemical reactions that affect our emotions or the emotions that create other chemical reactions. And when you then, as you quite rightly said earlier, uh, William, introduce all this stuff now that is um, in our food and drink, um, we are being uh, frazzled chemically um, and it's affecting us emotionally and it's affecting us physically and it's affecting us uh, mentally in terms of our ability to think straight. And a lot of the, well, a lot of this stuff, I said the vast overwhelming majority of the problems that are being highlighted in children in terms of behavior, when you chart them back, it, it, it goes to when this explosion of chemicals started um, appearing in their food and drink. I mean, you know, soft drinks, what you call in America sodas. I mean, please, it's poison. Mm -hmm. um, and it's poisoning people's um, ability to think and ability to have balanced emotions. This is why they're going, um, you know, 
off the rails because they are imbalanced. They're imbalanced because there's a chemical imbalance. In the book, you make a very insightful observation concerning the correspondence between brain activity or usage, DNA, and dark matter. Tell us about that for a moment. Well, you know, if you're going to control billions of people, fundamental to that is you've got to keep them ignorant of, of, of not only of what there is to know, but what is known even in the public domain. And, um, you know, it's been a, such a revelation for me. I mean, I was a guy, I, I was never went to university or college or anything like that. I went to the, the lowest school you could imagine in the, in the stream in England in the 50s and 60s and then went off to be a professional soccer player. I've done all my learning. Um, in my own uh, time, in, under my my own control, um, and so it's been a, a revelations to me to find out just just how much is known that the people don't know about. Um, and people say things like, "I saw it with my own eyes." And I say to people, "When you look through your eyes, what do you see? Do you see everything that exists in the space?" Well, yeah, mate. Well, how can you? Do you see the level of X-rays? Can you see what X-rays see? Can you see what infrared sees? No. Well, no. We can only see, um, and even then we see with our brain, our eyes, we can only perceive the most staggeringly tiny frequency range known as visible light. It's only a, a small part of what it, uh, science says exists in the universe. So we're actually interacting in this five-sense reality with a tiny, tiny frequency range of perception and then laughing at anyone that says that um, there are entities that exist outside this uh, visible light range that actually look very different to us. Oh, you're mad, mate, and all the stuff. Um, um, someone once said, um, or rather I saw a, a car sticker once in California, and it said, uh, you laugh at me because I'm different. I laugh at you because you're all the same, and it is a different way of looking at it but the thing is what what um what exists in this vast vast um area that we cannot see and that's only the um the, the what the science says that this point exists of course far more exists and when you look at um, some of the figures i know they're approximate but they are quite um instructive i would suggest um 95 percent take a mean figure of uh, DNA is known as junk DNA by science because they don't know what it does. Right. Something like 95% and then some um, of um, what is uh, said to exist in the universe we cannot see. And then you get something like 95% of uh, brain activity or, or what the brain is doing does not relate to the waking state. Now, these figures are quite compelling um, in the sense of, um, you know, I think I see an elephant in the living room here. Right. Um, and for me, what's happening, and, and this is what these Russian scientists decided was happening, funnily enough, is that this 90-odd uh, percent of junk DNA is to a large part connecting us in um, to these other infinite levels of reality. But we are um, imprisoned within a very small area of potential experience, which is visible light, the five senses. We talk about the sixth sense. Well, it's the sixth sense and then a heck of a lot more. And the sixth sense and these other levels beyond visible light, beyond what we think we can see, that's what this other um, vast areas of this other so-called junk DNA is connecting us into. And when... Um, you open yourself to it, you can travel um, beyond this five sense uh, reality and experience and access knowledge and understanding that's not available here in this matrix. Um, and um, what, what the whole of society is structured to do, if you look at it, is to hold us in five sense reality. Everything is to entice the five senses of sight, of taste, of all the others, touch. It's, it's trying to hold us into the five sense reality. But when you go beyond that, and it's, 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 it's more than symbolic that five sense reality occupies a fraction of DNA and the rest of it occupies the rest of DNA, it's because what exists beyond this five sense world is infinite. Um, and not um, the, the, the finite reality that we perceive here. 
Infinite Love is the Only Truth. Everything Else is Just an Illusion, is the title of David Icke's new book. Get it from bridgeoflove.com. David, I, I love the story that you told about your awakening in Brazil. Could you, in the few moments that we have uh, left, tell us a little bit about what you experienced in Brazil and how this led to this awakening? Well, the funny, the funny thing was uh, that um, uh, I, I um, had been feeling um, in the run-up um, to going to Brazil or being asked to go that what I needed to do if I was going to go to the next stage was I needed to see on the five senses and see get a get a fix on what existed there and I don't I don't you know I, I, I was brought up in the 60s never never took a psychedelic drug or anything none of it and I've only taken it uh, three times ever and I don't I've never done it since because don't need it I, I, right. it taught me something now I want to go there without that stuff, and that—that's that, what, because that can be addictive too, and you can use get addictive to go, and, and again you go round and round and round in the vortex and don't move on. Sure. But when I took uh, this uh, plant uh, called um, ayahuasca in Brazil over two nights, it took me into a realm where I did experience and saw what lay beyond this reality, and this was just bliss beyond belief. And this voice, very clear, loud, um, uh, dignified voice, talked to me for five hours um, um, uh, in a very, very compelling way about the nature of reality. It's what started me on this journey that I'm, I'm going into now. And what it said was, forget all the complexity, forget all the things that, that, that all the diversions that pull you here and pull you there. There's only one thing you really need to know. Infinite love is the only truth everything else is illusion and it said it over and over and over again and what it, what it was saying with infinite love infinite love is infinite everything it's infinite intelligence infinite wisdom infinite knowing it's that level that is all that does not think that does not to use the, the term emote it just is it just knows and when you hold that understanding that that's all that there is that's the only truth, the existence of that. Everything else is, comes from the imagination of that one consciousness. Then um, you start to see the world in a completely different way, and you start to live life instead of, um, as most of us have done, let life live us. When, when, when we let life live us, what we're doing is we're letting the program dictate our reality. David, I thank you so much for joining us today on Dreamland. It's been a wonderful pleasure talking with you, sir. You're about to experience something that you just can't get elsewhere. Emmy Award-winning science reporter Linda Moulton Howe reporting on the absolute leading edge of science, discovery, and the true mysteries of the unknown. Don't miss her website, earthfiles.com, the one science website that tells you the secret and gives you the facts others dare not earthfiles.com this week she's reporting on something terribly important the status of the bird flu virus the real story here she is from Albuquerque Linda Moulton Howe thanks Whitley and it is becoming incredibly disturbing first I'm going to talk about another virus that's here in the United States that is uh, changing enough to also raise red flags to medical authorities about what it could do this season of 2005 to 2006. A medical authority at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C., told Associated Press this week that the West Nile fever virus working its way through America is more virulent than its viral cousin in Europe, Asia, and Africa, and, quote, has caused more cases of paralysis than there were in many years of polio, unquote. By 2005, it has spread to nearly every state. In 2004, one-third of American West Nile fever cases reported to the Centers for Disease Control had brain and nervous system complications 
such as meningitis and encephalitis. Worse, in a CDC study to be published next month in July 2005, an estimated 10% of Americans who develop the most severe form of West Nile disease will have polio-like paralysis. Many patients are in their 30s to their 50s. The growing paralysis problems are of great concern, as well as the death toll. Since 1999, CDC has officially accounted for more than 16,600 human cases and 654 deaths. One West Nile victim whose left leg has been paralyzed from the waist down since 2003 is 56-year-old Patricia Heller, who works for a doctor in Boulder, Colorado. Until the virus hit her, she was a healthy skier and bicyclist. Today, she says, quote, there was no recognition that West Nile could paralyze and kill people that were healthy and relatively young. We were really caught off guard, unquote. Doctors also now realize that recovery from a West Nile virus attack can take weeks. The Chicago Health Department data on West Nile cases found that 50% of known patients were sick for 10 days at least, and on average, it took those patients two months to get over lingering chronic fatigue. Another virus mutation that has the entire world medical community nervous is the bird flu in Southeast Asia that has now jumped from birds to humans and pigs. 54 people are dead from bird flu, which is also known medically as H5N1 influenza. Chinese officials say a recent flu outbreak among wild birds is twice as large as they thought. 178 bar-headed geese found dead the first week of May on a nature reserve were dead from H5N1 flu. Now all nature reserves in China have been sealed off. Avian influenza could also be infecting up to half of the pig population in some areas of Indonesia without causing symptoms in the pigs, the journal Nature reported recently. One Indonesian virologist told Nature, quote, I think pigs pose a much greater threat of spreading the disease to humans than poultry, unquote. The reason is that swine are very close genetically to humans. Therefore, human and avian flu viruses can exchange genetic information, which could lead to a hybrid virus with the ability to spread easily among people. Health organizations around the world dread the increasing and dangerous possibility that bird flu could be the next worldwide pandemic. Even in Brazil at the end of May, authorities ordered the slaughter of 17,000 chickens after 6,500 died from a mysterious respiratory illness in the Brazilian state of Mato Grosso do Sul. Officials worry that the illness might be H5N1. Lab results will be reported this month. The dangerous H5N1 bird flu did not emerge until eight years ago in 1997 when chickens in Guangdong province, China, outside of Hong Kong, became ill and some people got sick then and died. The government ordered all the chickens in the province to be killed and burned, but that did not stop the H5N1 virus. It has spread to all domestic bird populations throughout Southeast Asia, including domestic and wild. And now it's just a matter of time, medical experts say, before more efficient spread from human to human begins setting off what could be a horrific pandemic. Airplane travel around the globe means the bird flu virus can spread quickly, as SARS did in 2003. One American epidemiologist thinks a pandemic could start within the next two years. He is Dr. Michael Osterholm, professor of epidemiology and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. 
The H5N1 situation in Southeast Asia is in a very precarious point right now in that we have had ongoing transmission to humans uh, in a very limited way, namely that the virus is able to enter into the lung cells of a very small number of people. What we are concerned about are really two factors. One is how easily can it get into lung cells of humans, and that is one part of the virus that currently must change even more to make that really efficient. But the second part of it is, can humans then transmit it to others? And that requires a second part of the virus to also change to allow it to basically explode out of the human lung cells. And unfortunately, in both instances, the virus is emerging that way, and that's why we're so concerned that uh, although we've been dealing with these limited number of cases for the past several years, it might very well only be a matter of days to weeks to months before we see that virus change enough so that it would start to be transmitted readily between humans and then start the world pandemic. In this global planet right now, if H5N1 could transmit from human to human, like SARS, uh, with very little immunity of zero, what do you realistically expect the consequences would be in the human population? Well, first of all, any pandemic strain of influenza, namely a strain that has not previously been seen in the human population or one that was seen 50 or more years ago and thus very few people alive would still have protective antibody from it, is always a problem for us. We worry about that because of the increased number of deaths that would occur with that kind of situation. But also we worry about which strain of the virus emerges because we have clear evidence that not all pandemics are equal in their ability to kill. Some are moderately effective, some are even very effective. And so when you combine a situation where you have a very effective virus at causing disease and death, combined with it has not been seen in the population, so there's no residual protection in the population for many years. It's kind of the perfect storm of influenza uh, pandemics. And unfortunately, that would be the case right now with the H5N1. This virus has been a very lethal type virus as viruses go in the influenza area in the humans in Southeast Asia, and I might even add in the domestic bird population, and it clearly is one that we have not seen on a worldwide basis in any measurable human history, meaning dating back to 100 years ago, and we could actually measure uh, antibody from people who were alive in the 30s and 40s that would tell us was that virus even around in the late 1800s. Uh, So we don't have any recent experience with it and would mean that we're very vulnerable and that with the severity of this virus infection, it could also be very lethal. How many people died with the 1918 swine flu? Recent studies uh, conducted by a group of historians have actually gone back country by country to look at the 1918-19 pandemic, and the really, I think, most thoughtful and very well uh, researched numbers now estimate that between 50 to 100 million people died during the 1918 pandemic, uh, and many of those died uh, actually from the same kind of illness that we're seeing in the H5N1 patients today, a thing called a cytokine storm or an immune reaction that the body has actually to the virus. This is why we're so concerned about the H5N1 because it looks like it could be a duplicating kind of experience in 1918. Let me just add one additional piece that's so critical is that the 1918 population numbered only about 1.8 billion people on the face of the earth. Today we have 6.5 billion people, so that even if the uh, 1918-like experience were to occur today, you're talking, uh, using those 1918 numbers, of anywhere from 180 to 360 million people could die from this uh, particular strain of virus. When you talk with your colleagues, both here in the United States and internationally now, uh, what is your worst case? At this point, none of us know when and where the next pandemic will begin. Uh, but we can tell you that it's going to happen. Pandemics and influenza are just a part of Mother Nature. There have been 10 of them in the last 300 years around the world, some of them much more severe, like one in 1830, one in 1918, others less severe, like the one in 1957 and the one in 1968. We're overdue for another pandemic. Uh, it is going to occur. That's a matter of uh, what type of illness we see with the patients. Nonetheless, we'll still have millions of deaths. It's just a matter of we have many millions or millions of deaths. And I think that that's the point that we all recognize and can say with some certainty, just like hurricanes, earthquakes, and volcanic activity will occur, so will pandemics. And what do you in the medical community do? Well, at this point, the single 
most important weapon we can uh, bring to bear to this is vaccine. And unfortunately, we're still dealing largely with a 1950s vaccine, uh, meaning that we've not really progressed much in either technology or in the ability to produce the vaccine than we had 50 years ago. That is our single biggest stumbling block. Right now, we wouldn't have any vaccine for probably six months into the pandemic because we have to use the strain that is circulating once it starts causing that pandemic as the seed strain to make the vaccine. And second of all is we really only have a very limited amount of capacity on a worldwide basis to make this vaccine. Today we could make at most about uh, 350 to 400 million doses of this vaccine as it's currently constituted. We could probably stretch that to as much as a billion doses. But having said that, it's going to take at least two doses per person. So in the end, if you do the math, that comes out to about 500 million people to get vaccine in the first year, not not right away, in the first year. So that that that's, happened only, that's only about 14% of the world's population. What is the worst case for the planet if H5N1 does take off and transmit human to human? I can't imagine anything more catastrophic affecting the human race today than a pandemic of H5N1 influenza around the world. Um, as we talked about the 1918-1919 experience, if we were to have a similar experience, and I might add there are a number of reasons why modern medical technology will not do much to change that. We don't have the medicines or the capacity today much more than we had in 1918 for this type of illness. Uh, that then said, if we had uh, even 180 million illnesses, which would be the low end of the range uh, looking at the 1918 experience, that would give you some context in that uh, if you look at HIV AIDS, as horrible as it has been to date, only about 26 million, and I say only, not in disrespect, only 26 million people have died. Pandemic influenza in one year could do what HIV hasn't done in 35 years. Yeah. And what do you think the likelihood is that H5N1 could take off in 2005 or 2006? I can't say with certainty that, it's, that this is going to be the strain that will take off. I think that there's every indication it will be. I think that it's going to happen sooner than later. But again, I come back to the point that we as a world have to understand another pandemic of influenza will occur. And therefore, while this is surely the highest risk candidate we have right now, we can't take comfort in the fact that even if it didn't emerge, that we're out of the woods. We have to understand that pandemic influenza is a reality of our world, just our, as our hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and uh, other meteorologic-like events. And we have to be prepared for this, and unfortunately, right, right now, we're not. What do you think is the most likely scenario, I'm assuming beginning in, in Asia, but could you describe for me what you think might happen if H5N1 takes off in the human population? As soon as we document uh, transmission of H5N1 at a community level or a regional level in the world, um, there will be an immediate cry to close borders uh, in an attempt to try to slow the spread of it down. We will see overnight, literally, the uh, stopping of international trade and travel as we currently know it. This, in turn, will lead to a whole series of economic uh, and product availability events which will be devastating because we live in this global just-in-time economy and uh, many of the goods and items that we expect and need every day to uh, live and exist in this country, for example, will not be available. That will be true worldwide. Uh, also, we will watch uh, through the eyes of the international media this infection literally march around the world. And so we'll get to see firsthand the kinds of devastation that will occur country by country. Even with the borders closed, there's no doubt in my mind that because of all the movement of people, illegal and legal, that we will still see the virus make its way around the world quickly, and it won't be long, and all the continents will be involved. And I'm assuming that quarantine would be the order of the day? Quarantine will be something that every world leader will want to use immediately as some way to protect themselves. And while it may slow the virus spread down, it's a lot like putting screen doors on a submarine. It still will not make it. Uh, and so uh, we will see this virus move quickly, even with quarantine. What would you tell your own family if it is uh, now raging in the United States? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information that we can tell 
uh, our loved ones and our colleagues that's going to bring great comfort. This is going to be a difficult situation. We currently today don't have the vaccines, the medicines, or any other means of really stopping this transmission. The best we can do is try to reduce it. And uh, frankly, on a given day, uh, there is no magic bullet that we're going to be able to bring forward short of having an international vaccine supply, which is not in the cards right now. I've heard announcements from the National Institutes of Health uh, that they are trying to anticipate the potential spread of H5 and are trying to come up with some kind of a vaccine. Uh, How can they do that without having the exact virus that they would have to be protecting against? Uh, Currently, efforts at the NIH are really directed at taking the currently circulating H5N1 strain and making early vaccines to it to try to study it to see how it really affects people's immune system, how we can actually administer it and reduce the amount of material that's uh, provided each individual, thus trying to stretch the vaccine. And so those pieces of work are going on right now. Unfortunately, uh, we really want and we believe we need the actual circulating strain to get the best protection. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this work that's being done right now by the NIH is very critical. Let me add that one last piece, though, which is the reality of our vaccine supply system today is that, of course, even if we come up with the magic bullet vaccine, we don't have the industrial or government capacity to make much vaccine. And so even in a year's time, we could only hope to make anywhere between somewhere around the 500 million uh, protective dose level for the entire world, which is less than 14% of the world's population. So what you're saying is that if the H5 virus should begin to spread among humans this year or next year, the really only possible scenario is a tremendous amount of death until the virus itself is stopped by all the death? At this point, uh, we have to realize that pandemics, well, as, as horrible as they are, do go away. And what we mean by that is, is that eventually the strain that is so deadly will lessen its ability to kill and will ultimately become the circulating strain that we see from winter to winter. Uh, And when that happens, we still worry about it because we know in this country each year up to 35 to 50,000 people still die from a routine garden variety influenza. But it will basically, say, attenuate itself or weaken to the point where it will become that strain and not the one that is so deadly that it could kill millions and millions. Uh, And uh, unfortunately... That's a heck of a price to pay to get to that point of that virus attenuation, but uh, we do know that pandemics won't go on forever. Meaning that we may lose up to 300 million people around the world. We could. We could. We sure could. We would say before, that's a hell of a price to pay to get through a pandemic. The World Health Organization, known as WHO, recently said in its website, quote, who believe the appearance of H5N1, which is now widely entrenched in Asia, signals that the world has moved closer to the next pandemic. While it is impossible to accurately forecast the magnitude of the next pandemic, we do know that much of the world is unprepared for a pandemic of any size, unquote. And this week, New Scientist magazine reports, quote, amid recent signs that H5N1 bird flu virus is acquiring the ability to spread more rapidly among people, many health authorities are pinning their hopes on Tamiflu, that's spelled T-A-M-I-F-L-U, the only available antiviral drug known to be effective in blocking this virus. But Tamiflu is in short supply and may not be enough to stop a pandemic anyway. In the meantime, the World Health Organization is stepping up efforts to acquire a massive stockpile of Tamiflu, which it hopes will at least slow down any emerging pandemic Unquote. The problem is, as Dr. Osterholm emphasized, whatever vaccine or antiviral drug is produced, there are no facilities in any nation on this planet big enough to manufacture the 12 billion doses needed to protect the world's population from the next pandemic. It's an amazing uh, story Whitley, because it appears to be closer than anyone ever thought that we would be at this point in 2005. Well, you know, Linda, there is a way 
to increase the, ex the, the strength of the immune system. There is a substance called beta-glucan, B-E-T-A-G-L-U-C-A-N, which uh, is readily obtainable. Uh, uh, Natrol is a, one company that makes it that I use. Uh, Beta-Precise beta is another that I've used, uh, both of which products are in, are actually do contain a substantial amount of beta-glucan. And you can get them on the Internet. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, we don't sell them on our store, but I, I buy them myself from Swanson Vitamins. And they are, this is a substance that is known to significantly increase the power of the immune system to the extent that there is a study going on in Canada now that the use of beta-glucan can actually get things to the point where a person can be uh, immunized or, or safe against things like anthrax, and they are known to reduce the, the or at least anecdotally, there's no study about this, but mm -hmm. th that the increased immune system response does reduce the effectiveness of viral invaders. So in an emergency, I'm not saying this is an antidote or it's, a, it's proof against anything, but it might help if you find yourself unable to get a hold of Tamiflu or there, and there is no vaccine and this thing starts to spread. Another thing I want to say is this. We watch this constantly on Unknown Country. It is a red flag issue for us and we have people watching the news in uh, Vietnam, India, in China, and somewhere else, but I forget where, uh, all the time for any stories, any local stories even, of individual to individual transmission of this disease, uh, so that we could, we'll be, try to be as early as we possibly can with the information that this has become a human-based virus. Right, and has already killed 54 in Asia, and I learned something amazing while working on this report for Earth Files in Dreamland. Nature has done uh, reporting on this recently, and one of the stories at the end of May was entitled, Bird Flu Spreads Among Java's Pigs. And there is this very intelligent virologist in Java. He, in fact, was one of the first people to, in 2003 who released data showing that there were mass deaths of chickens at the time there that was directly linked to H5N1 and what happened he got in trouble with the government because he released that information now he is who has done the test on the pigs has, uh, it has been confirmed by others and when Nature Magazine in the process of vetting its uh, journal article, and Nature is probably one of the two most respected science nature journals in the world, when they called up the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, known as FAO, and the World Organization for Animal Health, known as OIE, to talk and ask about what they were doing concerning now the confirmation of H5N1 in pigs, they were told, quote, it was only a rumor. This is after medical confirmation. And as nature stressed that the Indonesian government needs to take seriously the fact that this is already in swine that can move even more readily to humans, but this shows that in this bureaucratic world, the disconnect between the facts and what is assumed by governments is still a huge problem. And it is completely beyond the capacity of this planet, of the population of this planet, in the form of any of its governmental institutions to deal with this. We are really just waiting for the bomb to go off at this point, Linda. It's incredible, isn't it? And I often wonder, I've asked a few virologists, but obviously, you know, uh, research funding and, and a lot of things are dependent on federal grants, and, and they can't be overly critical, but this is... Uh, an amazing situation in the year 2005 of the 21st century to realize that the entire medical community is expecting that we are going to be hit by a pandemic that could be potentially equivalent to 1918 swine flu and yes. we don't have any facilities on the planet 
to generate the vaccines at the quantity necessary to what essentially would be vaccinate a six and a half billion population. Linda, thank you very much for a sobering report. Linda Moulton Howe's website, earthfiles.com. You better keep up with it. Things are changing fast. Earthfiles.com. Next week on Dreamland, I believe we're going to have David Ray Griffin with us, uh, the 9-11 expert. And uh, now people are signaling to me that that's not the case. In any case, there will be a next week's book. I mean, that's astonishing. Is how many is now? Yeah, I mean, that's okay, I don't count him. You know, I, I keep. I don't know if one. I start. I, I start lo- lo- looking around. You know, going on the path to for, for the next the next stage. Because what you say, William, is absolutely right. Um, it's funny enough when when I wrote my first uh, book on um, these kind of subjects, going back to ninety one now, uh, called Truth Vibrations. The opening line is um, something like, I'm, "I'm just starting a journey, and maybe you'll come with me." Because it it was um, it was clear to me then that. Um, this was going to be a journey, uh, and the thing is that that I find it, 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 there's a a great quote that's attributed to uh, the uh, Greek uh, philosopher Socrates, which is, "Wisdom is knowing how little we know." And what tends to happen uh, too often, I think, um, is that people do really great work at one level of understanding, whether it's the five sense conspiracy and the banking conspiracy and all that stuff. And that's great. They do fantastic work on my hand up to them. But if you stop there, you're only going to get part of the picture. And unfortunately, one of the great things that edits people off the path of continuing to walk is belief, belief systems, whether it's religious belief system or whatever. They start to um, come across information, understandings that are completely at odds with their belief system. And they tend to either dismiss them or, or simply won't go there because... They, they, they know their belief system will be under pressure. What I've done, because I just want to know what, what, what the truth is uh, within me, I, you know, I, that's, that's my um, prime motivation. I, I really want to know uh, the, the nature of what we're um, involved in here. The nat- He's a voice from the indefinable all that is for all who are attempting to override the program called the Matrix that controls humanity, a race lost in a cosmic game drowning in the rules of what he terms the God program. We know this voice as David Icke. In his new book, Infinite Love is the Only Truth, Everything Else is Illusion, he beckons us to a place beyond the matrix, a still point where nothing vibrates and everything just is. Infinite oneness and all possibility are its names. This is the unknown country, this is dreamland, and we welcome David Icke. Hello, David, how are you? I'm good, William. You? Oh, it's fantastic. Thanks so much uh, for joining us today. I understand that uh, you've just returned from South Africa. Yeah, I just had an amazing uh, 10 days with uh, someone who's become uh, one of my uh, closest friends called Kredo Mutwa, who's uh, uh, a Zulu shaman, but he's, he's known as a Sanusi. It's the, the highest level of their shamanistic stream. He's 83 now. He's wow. been initiated into the ancient African knowledge now for 50 years or more and um, we, we just hit it off the first time we met some years ago and we've become really really close friends and what's fantastic William when you meet people like Cradle is that you realize that although we may use different names we're all actually talking about the same basic knowledge um, and what uh, confuses us and gives us the, the feeling of Division and difference is is just the language we use. Uh, for instance, well, one of the things he did for me was uh, throw the bones, throw the animal bones. Now, to people in the West, they'd go throw the animal bone in 1991. And uh, when everything settled down, um, I uh, looked at the world in a completely different way, and it was like a veil had lifted. Um, instead of hearing the words of politicians and people like that, I was seeing the I was reading the silences and the white bits between them, and uh, I started to hit this amazing synchronistic uh, path from the early 1990s, which was leading me to uh, knowledge and information and people and people uh, who uh, were researchers, yes, but also people who were on the inside of this, people who had been victims of it, and very clearly uh, a, a structure emerged of a few interbreeding families who were sitting at the top of a 
uh, compartmentalized multi-level pyramid of control um, in which they controlled the banking cartel, the political system, the education system, the uh, the uh, pharmaceutical um, cartel, the oil cartel, the transnational corporations, the media at ownership level. And um, when, you, when I realized how the structure worked, it was a bit like um, putting the, the straight bits together in a jigsaw. Once you've got that frame within which it works, you can put the pieces in the middle together quicker. And so it's got faster and faster as the 90s unfolded and became the uh, 21st uh, century. Um, but these puzzle pieces have gone together and it's it's um, no longer a theory in the sense that things I was writing about, not just me, there's loads of people out there. If it was just me, I'd think, why is it just you? No, this is this is this under bones. It's a witch doctor. Oh, and all these bones were were um, animal bones that actually go back a long time, and they're carved uh, into shapes and symbols, and they just read the energy field in exactly the way that um, things like tarot cards and rune stones and stuff like that do. In fact, Credo's wife not only is a, a bone thrower and uh, amazingly accurate like he is. Uh, she's also a, a tarot card reader, so it's kind of the interesting to to see that we're all sp- talking about the same basic uh, themes, but we just use different language, and that confuses us. And Credo's fantastic because he sits at that uh, that cusp point between the ancient African knowledge and what we call the the, the modern or Western world, and he can talk both languages, which is why it's uh, uh, very easy to um, spend time with him and see that. Indeed, we are all um, talking about the same uh, one knowledge uh, in uh, only uh, language forms uh, that are different. Mm -hmm. You know, when uh, Whitley interviewed me recently, he asked why I wanted to talk with you. We had announced this interview, and I told him that uh, our mutual buddy, Tim Crawford at UFO TV, had... Oh, Tim, yeah. Yeah, at uh, UFO TV, had sent me a copy of your Matrix DVD, which I thought was phenomenal. And what I had told Whitley is I said, look, here's a guy, David Icke, he's been on this path a long time. He's on an amazing path of discovery. And I just sense that he's about to go through the Stargate to the next level of understanding. And I knew that you had a new book coming up, out about this transformation. And I was really excited to talk with you about it. And so now that I've had a chance to read Infinite Love is the Only Truth and Everything Else is Illusion, I first want to congratulate you on your 15th of reality, life, everything. And uh, so I just keep walking, and it's taken me from five cents investigation of, uh, you know, like I say, banking scams and 9-11 scams and all that stuff into the interdimensional um, level of it. And now with, with this book, it's, um, it's a leap into, the, into the, the, the structure of the illusory reality within which all the other stuff actually unfolds. Yeah, I think, uh, and that's a great place to start. In fact, let's uh, begin sort of with the root chakra of your work and wind our way through your path of transformation. The, the world, you've said, is controlled by a network of secret societies manipulated by the Illuminati who have structured our world to create maximum fear and stress. And this is because, I believe you say, that in the interspaces of the matrix is a lost reptilian race that feeds on human fear, which means that Earth, in a sense, is a fear farm, and then DNA, DNA then becomes the fear antenna or transmitter that connects us to that matrix. Talk about how you came to this conclusion. Well, um, uh, let's um, maybe make the point straight away. I didn't go looking for it. I mean, you don't sit in a darkened room um, and think... I just concluded this is what's going on, uh, because from 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 our uh, conditioned reality, I mean, it's like, what did he say? Um, what happened was, and, and my life's been like this. Um, it would take too long to talk about it now, but I had an amazing series of experiences when I was uh, still a television presenter with the BBC, and just afterwards, um, that just blew blew my head off, and. For about three months, I didn't know what planet I was on. This is back in 1990. Uh, and um, where, 